Hello, I'm Dr. Okichuku Ibanu. I'm a gynecologic oncologist. I will be discussing the use of retroperitoneal dissection during endoscopic gynecologic surgery. The learning objectives are to review the relevant retroperitoneal pelvic anatomy during minimally invasive gynecologic surgery, and then outline some scientific data on the use of these techniques to resect gynecologic cancers, and hopefully we'll have some time to review a video illustration of the retroperitoneal spaces. I have no disclosures. So to start with, the retroperitoneal spaces of the pelvis are avascular spaces which are typically collapsed and then need to be developed during a surgery. And the main reason we utilize these spaces is to safely skeletonize vascular pedicles and uh, minimize blood loss, but also to identify critical structures uh, to avoid injury and morbidity during surgery. The pelvic spaces from anterior to posterior are the retropubic space, the vesicovaginal space, and vesical uterine space, paravesical, pararectal, the rectovaginal space, and then the presacral space. This diagram shows the spaces, and from anterior, we have the space of retius with the bladder posteriorly to that, and on both sides of the bladder, we have the paravesical spaces. Now, the vagina, which is posterior to the bladder, has the vesico-vaginal space and vesico-uterine space in between the vagina and bladder. Now, lateral to the vagina here, we do see the cardinal ligament, and the uterine artery is typically branching off the internal iliac artery in that direction. And so we delineate the paravesical space and then posterior to that, the pararectal space in order to skeletonize the uterine artery. The pararectal space straddles both aspects of the rectum. In front of the rectum and behind the vagina is the rectovaginal space. And then behind the rectum is the presacral space. So it's important that we understand the boundaries of these spaces in order to understand how we get to these spaces during surgery. And so we usually identify certain landmarks that allow us to then delve into the spaces using, typic using typically blunt dissection. The space of retius is bounded by the pubic bone anteriorly and then posteriorly by the bladder and you have the paravaginal tissue uh, on both sides. For the vesicular uterine space, as explained in the last diagram, we have the anterior aspect of the uterus as the posterior portion of that space, and then you have the bladder anteriorly, and on both sides, the bladder pillars. With the paravesical space, we have the external iliac artery laterally, and then we have the pubic bone anteriorly, we have the bladder and bladder pillars medially. Posteriorly, we have the uterine artery, and the uterine artery separates the paravesical and pararectal spaces. The, um, and the uterine artery is the anterior border of the pararectal space. And then medially in that space, we have the ureter. We have the internal iliac artery laterally. And then we have the anterior lateral aspect of the sacrum posteriorly. And for the rectovaginal space, we have the vagina anteriorly, the rectum posteriorly, and then the uterosacral ligaments laterally straddling that space as they run from the posterior aspect of the vagina and uterus to the anterior aspect of the rectum. The retrorectal space, the pre-rectal, pre-sacral space is bounded anteriorly by the rectum, posteriorly by the sacrum, and then you have parasacral tissues on both sides. This is a picture of a cadaver dissection showing the left side retroperitoneum dissected out, and you can see the ureter on the medial leaf of the peritoneum Lateral to that is the internal iliac artery. And then lateral to the internal iliac artery are the external iliac vessels right here. So between the ureter and the internal iliac artery is the pararectal space. Anterior border of the pararectal space is the uterine artery. And then you can see that the internal iliac artery continues as the obliterated hypogastric with the paravesical space lateral to that. The superior vesicle artery is seen here given off, uh, given off by the internal iliac just before it terminates as the obliterated hypogastric. Of course, up here on the uh, medial aspect of this frame, 
is the uterus and then the bladder anteriorly to that. This is a picture during the uh, open case. We have the internal iliac artery skeletonized here. You can see the impression of the external iliac artery right here. And right here is also the internal iliac vein. The internal iliac artery is giving off the uterine artery. And between the internal iliac artery and the ureter, which uh, my fingers are actually pressing on, is the pararectal space. The anterior border of that space is the uterine artery, and then diagonally across, lateral to the internal iliac artery, is the paravesical space. So endoscopic retroperitoneal dissections are used both for malignant disease and benign disease. And uh, I, I have to uh, mention that the, this is a technique and it's not a treatment. And so you can use it in any situation where you need to delineate the anatomy in order to accomplish safe resection, and in situations where you need very carefully to avoid injury to the ureter, bladder, rectum, and other critical structures. We're seeing an increase in adoption of minimally invasive surgery, and so um, it's important for the gynecologist who performs minimally invasive surgery to understand retroperitoneal anatomy because it can come in very handy during uh, certain complex dissections. And it has proven efficacy, backed up by scientific data in certain cancers. And certainly in the benign gynecologic literature, there are multiple reports of the use of minimally invasive surgery for hysterectomies and, and certain other situations. The benefits of a minimally invasive retroperitoneal dissection carry, of course, the inherent benefits of minimally invasive surgery. But uh, uh, in addition, you have a, an avoidance of unnecessary morbidity, unnecessary conversion to laparotomy can be avoided if the surgery can be accomplished safely by utilizing these pelvic spaces, which we discussed. And so in endometrial cancer, just very briefly, we had the large LAP2 trial, which came out in 2009 and um, supported the use of uh, laparoscopy for reception of endometrial cancers. Likewise, uh, with cervical cancers, we initially started out with conversion from open surgeries to robotic assisted and laparoscopic, laparoscopic surgery. However, uh, it must be noted that recent um, study data has indicated uh, potential adverse outcomes and survival in patients with cervical cancer who have laparoscopic surgery. So the use of that is debatable at this point in time. However, the principles remain the same and a lot of the advantages are still seen in terms of length of stay and the reduction in blood loss. For ovarian cancer, we utilize retroperitoneal dissections, mostly for early stage disease. For advanced, disease, advanced stage disease, the utilization of minimally invasive surgery is limited and uh, confined to mostly assessment for resectability. And um, in cases where there's disseminated costnematosis, you can actually get um, diagnostic information and an assessment of the need for um, radical open surgery. So we will take the time now to review a, a video of a radical hysterectomy. And um, in this uh, surgery, you will see the um, development of the retroperitoneal spaces. So a retroperitoneal dissection typically begins with making a peritoneal incision, and this usually follows the curvature of the pelvis. And I usually start by making the incision over the psoas muscle, not going any deeper than the peritoneum. You can carry the incision as high up as you wish to, depending on what the surgery entails. And then following that, development of the subperitoneal tissue teasing away the fatty adventitial tissue to expose the psoas muscle. And it's important to recognize that then the first landmark is the external iliac artery, which forms a triangle with the round ligament and the infundibulopelvic ligament. The ureter is seen here on the medial aspect of the peritoneum. And in the valley of this triangle, the, most of the retroperitoneal dissection proceeds. So in this frame, we're seeing the identification of the internal iliac artery. And proceeding from that, 
follows the opening up of the, recto, of the pararectal space, which lies between the internal iliac and the ureter, which is seen here. So opening up of the pararectal space then starts the process of skeletonizing the uterine artery, which is a branch off from the internal iliac. And we can see that coming in, in view uh, right here above the instruments. This space is avascular, and so as long as you stay within the right plane, you should not encounter any significant bleeding. The uterine artery is seen very clearly coming off of the internal iliac artery. And then following that, we proceed to develop the paravesical space, which is diagonally across from the pararectal space. Development of these two spaces allows the sculptization of the uterine artery, which can then be safely clamped, cut, tied off, and also keeps the ureter in full view during these maneuvers. The important structures to note in the paravesical space are the obturator nerve and then the obturator vein and artery, which lie a little bit uh, deeper than the nerve. And so as we can see in this frame, the uterine artery is being skeletonized and I'm just cutting away a lot of uh, loose uh, adventitial tissue in order to provide a clearer view of some of the surrounding viscera. This patient is having a radical hysterectomy. And so in order to have a good margin uh, of resection around the parametrium, typically uh, the uterine artery is cauterized and then cut. So as you can see here, the uterine artery is being prepared for cauterization and at some point during the video, I may uh, move the frame along in the interest of time. So as we see here, the uterine artery is being cauterized and will be cut in a, a few seconds. So below the uterine artery, if you staple or cut uh, deeper, you will be cutting the cardinal ligaments. So during certain complex gynecologic surgeries, which are benign, for example, fibroids or endometriosis, this technique is useful. And sometimes this is the first thing that I do in order to uh, reduce blood loss. Now we've cut the round ligament and we can see that the bladder flap has started to be developed, which is the initial step in opening up the vesicle uterine space. I will move us along in the interest of time. Now we are going to be seeing a little bit more development of the bladder flap on the right side. At the same time we do the, start to do that, we are starting to see a little bit of the section around the ureter, the distal ureter, uh, because this is a radical hysterectomy, we typically skeletonize the ureters and unroof them at their junctions with the uterine arteries. So in this frame, we can see some of the adventitial tissue around the ureter continues to be taken down. And this is just to control blood loss. I'm, grasping the distal uterine artery and starting to dissect that off of the ureter which is below. And this is in preparation for cauterizing and cutting that vessel. So the ureter, the ureter, distal uterine artery is being cut and Following that, we've lifted up the peritoneum over the bladder and started to develop the vesicouterine space. And typically I don't do the entire space from one side, I do about halfway and then move over to the contralateral side to continue the dissection. And it's easier to uh, complete the development of the vesicouterine space after the contralateral side has been opened up. Now on the, right, on the left side, we see the peritoneal incision, now delving, uh, down to the uh, round ligament. The incision is then carried cephalad. We usually try to stay close to the line of tolts, which is the reflection of the colon. 
I like to reflect the colon medially because it allows you to mobilize the uh, pelvic structures a little easier, especially in patients that have um, very um, uh, tight uh, pelvis. Here we have the psoas muscle, which has been freed up from um, loose peritoneal tissue. The external iliac artery and vein are usually found on the medial aspect of the psoas muscle, as you can see on the left side of the frame. And as we continue to delve deeper uh, in this situation, I've decided to take down some adhesions between the colon and the gonadal vessels. You can see the ureter being pointed out right now. It's peristalsin on the medial leaf of the peritoneum. I'm holding up the gonadal vessels, which are being skeletonized. And in, in this case, we're not taking the ovary, but if you have to, this peritoneal window allows you to resect the gonadal vessels safely. The round ligament is being uh, cut. And now we are coming to the uh, completion of development of the vesicle uterine space. So I typically identify this adventitial tissue, which appears whitish and, and loose, and that is the right plane to be in. And I usually use a sweeping motion to gently cauterize that tissue and allow the bladder to fall off um, anteriorly. And so, in the bottom part of the picture, you can start to see the vaginal cuff appear. And this pretty much gives you an idea of how much uh, you've dissected the bladder off and, um, and how much margin you'll have after you perform a colpotomy. And so it's important to have uh, some margin of tissue to uh, be able to close the vaginal cuff. So just moving us forward, In this frame, you can see the ureter starting to be scalpelized, and we take that dissection down to the junction between the ureter and uterine artery, and just as we did on the cotrilateral side, we'll unroof that ureter and, um, and uh, cauterize the uterine artery. But in this dissection, we've, uh, we're moving uh, a little bit backwards so that we can start to develop the pelvic spaces on that side. So we've identified the ureter, the internal iliac artery, is uh, on the left side, you can see the uterine artery branching off of the internal iliac, which is white, right here, it appears as a, a whitish cord. And tugging on it also helps to confirm its position because you should see movement uh, at its insertion uh, or its end, uh, just behind the pubic bone as the obliterated uh, hypogastric. And so now you can see that the Pararectal space has started to be developed uh, between the ureter and the internal iliac, uh, which is actually way back here. But then we see the branch off of the uterine artery, which is actually a little bit long in this patient. Beyond that, we start to develop the paravesical space, which is diagonally across that way. And so we identify the external iliac vein and artery, and then just lateral to the internal iliac artery, is the opening of that space, which we're starting to develop. We saw the obturator nerve right there, a whitish cord. And typically below that, you should see the obturator artery and vein. And sometimes you may see an aberrant obturator vessel. I'll move us forward. So in this frame, we are getting ready to open up the rectovaginal space. Now, the uterosacral ligaments in a radical hysterectomy typically tend to be skeletonized and cauterized in order to provide a um, safe margin of resection around the cervix. And so we identify the uterosacral ligaments, which usually appear like pant legs or trouser legs uh, running from the posterior uterus to the anterior rectum. And you have just lateral to the uterosacral ligaments, you have the ureters running on their way to um, the bladder. So it's important to um, identify the ureter as you dissect around the uterosacral ligaments because the distance between the two structures is very short. In this case, we're lifting up the loose peritoneum between the posterior vagina and the anterior rectum. And you can see that the incision is being made on the peritoneum. 
between the uterosacral ligaments in order to start opening up the space bluntly. As long as you stay between the uterosacral ligaments, the ureters should be safe. Now the uterosacral ligaments are being cauterized first on the right side. We usually do that in order to allow the uterus to be lifted up and uh, delineate the, the um, resection plane for the colpotomy. Same thing is being performed here on the right side. And in a few uh, short moments, the uterus uh, should be ready for a colpotomy. So in conclusion, as we've seen during this dissection, uh, retroperitoneal dissection and knowledge of the ret retroperitoneal anatomy is very useful in delineating important structures in the pelvis and also enables us to get control of the vasculature, reduce blood loss and morbidities during the surgery. And, and these are typically the reasons why you would have to convert from a laparoscopy to a laparotomy so that uh, knowledge of safe dissection can avoid that. The main advantage of, of using a retroperitoneal dissection is in the interest of patient safety, preventing unnecessary visceral injury, bleeding, and uh, conversion as mentioned above. And it's important for any gynecologic surgeon who is performing minimally invasive surgeries to gain competence and proficiency in being comfortable in the retroperitoneal space. And as I mentioned earlier, you can use this technique for any gynecologic surgery, regardless of the diagnosis, whether it be malignant or benign, and also even if you're doing an open surgery. And as we showed in the video of robotic assisted surgery, um, this technique actually comes in very handy and allows safe completion of uh, complex gynecologic cases. Thank you very much. I hope the presentation has been helpful. Thank you for your audience.